The Knowledge Experience Again by John Dewey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Knowledge Experience Again by John Dewey. I owe an apology to the editor and to the readers of this journal for returning a third time to the defense of my article on immediate empiricism. Footnote, volume 2, number 15, page 393. End footnote. But Dr. Boda's recent article, footnote, volume 2, number 24, page 658, end footnote, is so clear and compact that I cannot refrain from again taking a hand. Dr. Boda points out that since I recognize that an experience which is not itself a knowledge experience may be cognitive, i.e. have bearings which lead out into a distinctively knowledge experience, I cannot readily be charged with making such a gap between the dominantly non-knowledge experience and the knowledge experience as deprives the latter of all point when it comes. But he claims, one, that this later experience which identifies the thing of the first as being thus and so, a fearsome noise as a wind curtain fact, is essentially a pointing experience, a knowledge about, and hence does not give the full meaning or truth of the first, which can be found only, two, in an experience which is wholly of the acquaintance with type, having neither the leadings of the first nor the pointings of the second. And this he claims must be, three, an unconscious experience, a term which can have no other meaning assigned to it than the implication or presupposition of an object out of experience, conscious experience being then confined, on this basis, to relations between final out-of-consciousness terms. This position is, for, acutely identified with Woodbridge's definition of consciousness as a continuum, with its realistic implications. I wholly agree with the first two points save that empirically the complete acquaintance thing need not necessarily be an entire experience, but may be an element in a more complex experience, and this as a whole may have cognitive leadings. But if this third point is correct, empiricism, in presupposing things which cannot be experienced, has hanged itself on the topmost bough of the tree whose seed and fruit it meant and pretended to be. I marvel that Dr. Boda, in seeing so clearly the first two implications, did not follow the empirical clue. And, instead of arguing conceptually that the terminal experience must refer to something unexperienced, did not look about for some experience which should meet the conditions of complete cognitive fulfillment in a thing which itself is neither a leading on nor a pointing back. Take again the case of the fearsome noise which develops into a wind-curtain fact. What is its appropriate career? Surely not into an unconscious experience, but into an experience which in so far forth is practical or moral and aesthetic. The complete acquaintance which is self-adequate is, one might say, a relationship of friendship or affection, or of contempt and disregard, and of assurance or control. The complete acquaintance determines the attitude of, say, management of the thing as a means to an end, or of, say, amused recollection, not remembrance as logical pointing i.e. you are what once fooled me, an SP experience or judgment, but remembrance as recreation or revival in their literal immediate senses. I am enough of a Hegelian to believe that perfect knowledge is not knowledge in its intellectual or logical connotation at all, but such a thing as religionists and practical people have in mind, an attitude of possession and of satisfaction, the peace that passes understanding. It means control of self, because control of the object on which the status of the self contemporaneously depends. Here, if anywhere, the pragmatic is justified, like wisdom of its children. And if we have something more than the pragmatic, it is because this attitude of attained adjustment is so saturated with emotional or morally and aesthetically conscious content. If one will realize how largely discursive knowledge empirically fulfills itself in a coloring or toning, an immediate value element, in subsequent experiences, footnote, there is much in Dr. Gordon's article on feeling, this journal, volume 2, 
numbers 23 and 24, which I should gladly adopt as exegetical of my position. End footnote. One will, I think, be fully guarded against supposing that unconscious experience is the sole alternative to intellectualized experience. Unconscious the experience is with respect to logical determinations, but immediate experience is saturated with values that are not logical determinations. The epistemological idealist cannot deny this as a fact, because it is precisely this fact which makes him discredit immediate experience, and insists, therefore, upon its absorption into an absolute which is just and wholly logical. Such a position also differentiates itself from the realism which Bode criticizes. If consciousness were just cognitional awareness, Woodbridge would seem to have said the last word in calling it a continuum of objects, of objects which are, as objects, out of consciousness. For as cognitional or intellectual, it is surely the business, so to say, of consciousness to be determined, that is, determinate, solely in and through objects. Otherwise, common sense is crazy and science and organized insanity. But the things of which knowledge constitutes a continuum may be precisely immediate values which are not constituted by logical considerations, but by attitudes, adjustments, coordinations of personal activities. Knowledge, in the strict or logical sense, mediates these activities, which include, of course, passivities. Establishing certain leadings and pointings, certain equivalences, and thereby certain intermediaries and transitional points of immediate valences or worths. And when it has completely wrought out a certain equivalence, finds its own surcease in a new value, expressive of a new aesthetic moral attitude. From this point of view, knowledge is not, but develops, a continuum, an emotional content being as substrate, the continuum of which knowledge pointings or discriminated identities are the discretes. Footnote. See again Dr. Gordon's articles, and also her thesis, The Psychology of Meaning, pages 22 through 26. End footnote. Have we not the elements of a reconciliation of what is significant in realism and in idealism? We have something which is beyond consciousness as cognitional, and which determines consciousness as cognitional, literally determines it, in the sense that the practical aesthetic attitude, in order to maintain itself, evokes the reflective attitude, and logically determines it, in that the content of knowledge must conform to conditions which the knowledge consciousness does not itself supply. Footnote. See Studies in Logical Theory, page 85, and for a statement in psychological language, pages 253 to 256. End footnote. But this efficient and formal cause presents a situation in which a conscious agent or person is indispensably present. It is not a non-empirical thing in itself, against which idealism has stood as a protest, and it is something in which a conscious being plays a part. Is epistemological idealism anything but a transfer into the knowledge situation of a relation which actually holds in the practical aesthetic situation? a mistranslation which always calls out realism as a counterbalance, which tends, in the end, to destroy the peculiar individuality that is the essence of such situations, resolving individuality into terms of the universal, objective content which is alone appropriate to knowledge, and which hopelessly complicates the treatment of the knowledge situation itself by deliberately throwing away the key to its interpretation. I wish to take this occasion to say a few words also about Professor Bakewell's interesting contribution to this discussion. Footnote. This journal, Volume 2, Number 25, page 678. The preceding paragraphs stand as written prior to the appearance of Professor Bakewell's article. End footnote. My original contribution was intended, as Bakewell sees, to bring into sharper relief what seemed to be the fundamental point at issue— so that the artillery of the opponents of recent empiricism, for whose range and shot I profess the greatest respect, might fire there rather than at bogeymen or side issues. I must confess I did not succeed in so presenting it to Professor Bakewell. He says the idealist denies that any single actual experience, as existent or as known, is immediate and simply immediate. Page 690. By turning to page 394 of my original article, it will be seen that I there declare the nub of immediate empiricism to be precisely 
the thoroughgoing fallacy of the absolute identification or metaphysics of experience as known with experience as existent. This is the point at issue. Hence, objections which rest upon the fact that all knowledge involves immediate element are just non-relevant. That the distinction between the immediate content and the mediate content, together with their reference to one another, is necessary in and to the knowledge experience as such, I not only fully accept, but have been at considerable pains to expound and to attempt to explain in studies in logical theory. So when the idealist, page 688 of Bakewell's article, says that experience is always a complex of the immediately perceived and the immediately conceived, he is saying something which the empiricist accepts, so far as the content of a distinctively knowledge or logical experience is concerned. While he, one, takes fundamental issue with the implication that experience is always distinctively logical, and also, two, points out that even the distinctively logical experience is still always, in toto, an immediate experience, or, more specifically, that the distinction between immediate perception and its material, data, and mediate conception and its methods, thinking, is always within and for the sake of a value in experience which is pragmatic, personally, I should add, aesthetic, not reducible to cognitional terms. Since it is only as elements in the content of an immediate experience that the distinction between the immediately perceived, the sensibly given, and the immediately conceived, the relationally thought, occurs, it is obvious that immediate empiricism does not identify the immediacy for which it stands with one of the terms of its own content at a special juncture. Footnote. I repeat what I have said before. It is the essential vice of sensationalistic empiricism to make this identification between a functionally determined instrument and test of knowledge and experience as such. End footnote. When Professor Bakewell says that immediacy in this enlarged and general sense as noting that aspect of direct ownership, of personal appropriation, which is always found in concepts and principles of mediation, is a fact fully taken into consideration by idealism, he is saying something which doubtless his idealism takes due account of, but which many of us believe epistemological idealism is wholly impotent to take account of. It gladly assumes the benefit of such facts but only by introducing elements which are not and cannot be reduced to cognitional terms and relations, which connote emotional and volitional values, and to which humanism, pragmatism, radical empiricism are desirous of assigning their metaphysical weight. If Professor Bakewell's idealism takes such facts into consideration, then I believe he is, for all intents and purposes, an immediate empiricist though seemingly one not yet entirely free from epistemological bondage. End of The Knowledge Experience Again by John Dewey